So very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, welcome to the post lunch session. So we have two speakers with us, and we have in total 75 minutes available with us. So uh, I will request the speakers to finish their talk in say 25 minutes each, and then we'll leave floor open for say another 20, 25 minutes. So you want to come first? Yeah, just speak from here. So Professor Cesar Landa will start with his talk. Good afternoon. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be in this round table in New Delhi, in this important university, for discuss this important matters about the appointment of judges and the legitimate case. And, and um, in this uh, opportunity, we will talk about the uh, appointment of the judges in Latin America, and particularly in Peru, because uh, this, <clears throat> this task is in the framework of the justice and political. In Latin America, there is a refrain uh, that tell, tell me who appointed you, and I can tell you just how you will rule. Uh, this is due mainly to the actuation of the court as defender of the status quo, or that deferred to the political agenda of those currently in power when issuing their ruling. The Peruvian judicial experience in particular is not an exception but also shows that the power of judicial review has ended up debilitated when courts attempt to confront governmental power head on. Particularly, the practice of the judicial review has exhibited a jurisprudential need for a model of appointing case with the balance between the justice and the politics. Uh, the selection of mechanisms for the appointment of the judges um, there is a, have a relationship with the political power. But in the Peru, there are two mechanisms in force. One, depending on whether or the judges will administrate ordinary justice, we, can, we, we have a judicial power. Uh, but on the other side, we have a specialized justice as a part of the constitutional court. This uh, German, Spain, or Italian system. No? The appointment of the judge of the <coughs> judicial ordinary and to the government attorney general office uh, is in the model of the Constitution 1993, mm -hmm. has established a procedure consisting of a stage which essentially involves the assessment of ability, skill, and knowledge in the form of a written test, the evaluation of the applicant's professional development in the form of his curriculum vitae, a psychological evaluation and a personal evaluation in the form of an interview. <clears throat> the current constitutional design and trust the duty of selection, appointment, assessment, ratification, and removal to an autonomous constitutional body, the National Judicial Council, which consists of seven council members who are appointed by the Supreme Court, the Supreme Attorney Board, and five representative from civil society organization, public and private <coughs> university, bar association, and other uh, professional association. <coughs> the constitutional model has not only failed to prevent partisan influence, but it has also introduced another equal serious problem, the illicit influence of that network of corruption. Unfortunately, there is a high level of corruption uh, in my country that has been revealed the last uh, years, and uh, the chief federal prosecutor uh, began with an impeachment that he presented last August before the Congress of the Republic against the Supreme, Just the Supreme Court Justice Inostrosa, who escaped to Madrid, and now he is in process to extradition to Peru. No? And four former council member of the National Justice um, for the Allegate Commission of Crimes, ranging from criminal conspiracy to influence pending illegal representation, acceptance or solicitation of bribe for violation of official duties and offering or payment of bribe. <clears throat> As a result of the corruption scandal in the judicial system linked to the 
certain entrepreneurs and political parties. Um, the National uh, uh, Judicial Commission, uh, the president, uh, Mar uh, Martin Vizcarra of Peru, called an extraordinary plenary session of the Congress of the Republic in accordance with their powers of the constitutional powers and the parliament's member has been removed the council members in light of their serious offenses. This decision was adopted unanimously uh, the past 20 July. The president issued a call during his annual speech to the nation on 28 July, given in the chamber of the Congress for a constitutional reform regarding judicial and political matter. The president is calling to the people to pronounce about the judicial and political reform on 9 of December. The proposal of the judicial reform will change uh, the name and the first of the National Judicial Council to the National Board of Justice, but uh, made up of seven members who would be elected by a public contest of merit before there has been five. The, this proposes constitutional reform would give the National Board of Justice a period of no more than 18 months to review all decisions carried out by the council member who were removed. You know? So this uh, proposed a very uh, <coughs> challenge toward to reform the justice. A reform on the constitutional reform of the ju judicial and political system be scheduled uh, for the coming 9 November. <coughs> In particular, the proposal for the appointment of the charge of the government attorney general office uh, <coughs> um, is proposed in the constitutional reform <coughs> in uh, <coughs> like a competence of the National Board of Justice that shall have the following duties. First, appoint following a public contest of merits and personal assessment, charge and district attorneys of all levels Set appointments shall require the public and well-reasoned favorable vote of at least two-thirds of the legal member of the board's members. Second, reconfirm judge of <coughs> and district attorneys of all level every seven years with a public and well-reasoned vote and conduct an interim performance assessment of judges and district attorneys of all level every three years jointly with the judge academy. Those judges and district attorneys who are not reconfirmed or who are removed from office may not to be incorporated into the judiciary on the government attorney general office. <clears throat> and the third uh, reform, uh, look for enforce the removal from office of Supreme Court justice or chief federal prosecutor, as well as judge and district attorney of all levels, whether ex officio or at the request of the Supreme Court or the Board of Chief Federal Prosecutor, respectively. In the case of the Supreme Court Justice and Chief Federal Prosecutor, the National Board of <coughs> Justice may also issue warning of suspension of up to 120 uh, calendar days, based on criteria of reasonability and proportionality. The final decision shall be well-founded and based on a prior hearing in which the interested party is allowed to present his or her defense argument. This decision is not subject to appeal. But <coughs> we don't have only a reform in the judicial ordinary system. We have also a constitutional court. You know? And we have other kind of problems in the nomination of the candidate, uh, candidates of the judicial court. The Congress of the Republic is responsible for the appointment to the seven judges of the Constitutional Court with a majority of two-thirds of the unicameral Congress, which consists of a total of 130 representatives. It should be no surprise that when it comes to the appointment, the Constitutional Court judges, the political party with parliamentary representation, have an interest in influencing the nomination and appointment of these figures. In practice, however, the selection of constitutional court judges has led bar to shortcoming in the democratic system of constitutional control due to a lack of consensus <coughs> among the members of Congress. This Congress has led to a deterioration of the selection process and the consequent mistreatment of can candidates. 
For example, in 2007, after the media published a photo of a newly selected judge meeting with a high-ranking APRA, uh, former party, uh, the party of the former President Garcia, uh, and several military members accused of misdeeds under the Fujimori administration, the plenary of the Congress decided to suddenly annul the selection of the four judges. Nevertheless, this did not stop the Congress from appointing for new judges to the constitutional court. This led to contradiction of varying degree in the court's jurisprudence regarding the fight against corruption and even a passive tolerance uh, and impunity for the human rights violation. <clears throat> Later, in 2013, the new judges appointed to the constitutional court include two controversial former congressmen from the President Ojanta party, and a former congressman with the Fujimori party, and defense attorney of the ex-president Alberto Fujimori, dictatorship, who was found guilty of crime against humanity. This appointment sparked protests by citizens and institutions committed to defending human rights on the streets, no? leading to demonstrations that served as a clear expression of civil society dissatisfaction with the treaties being posted to democracy, like current in Poland. So, as a result, the Congress was forced in 2013 to back down from the appointment of all of the members nominated for the Constitutional Court, as well as annulling the appointment of the public ombudsman and three director of the Central Reserve Bank. Looking for the future, it is worth nothing that six of the Constitutional Court's justice will finish their term in the next year, 2019, at which point that different political groups in the Congress will once again have to reach a third majority, a, a, a 87 votes of the 113 members of the Congress to renew the Constitutional Court makeup. With these problems in the <coughs> judicial uh, ordinary system and the Constitutional Court appointment charges, it's important no, to define which it's not only the best way to appoint the judges, but also the profile of the ideal judge, no, because a judge profile is essential basis and the so-called requirement of legitimacy and compliance with law. This means that the person selected must be a jurist or legal scholar, first and foremost, who has exhibited a mastery of juridical science under human aspect, thus enabling him or her to contribute knowledge of the law and experience when hearing case. A judge must also demonstrate an ability to maintain neutrality and corruptibly and clarity in his or her opinion. Judge must remain independent when making judicial decisions involving political and private power. It is important to make sure that there is no hidden political or economic force lurking behind a judge's candidacy. Otherwise, the judge's future vote or opinion will eventually reveal adept not to the constitution, but to the jury or de facto powers. It is therefore necessary to determine the commitment of candidates seeking appointment as judge to the primary expression and different form of thought of our society. In this way, the current state of our justice system revealed the need of for democratic strengthening of the mechanisms used to appoint judges, along with the functional reorganization of the judicial task, given the crisis of legitimacy currently, afflicting judge jurisdictional decision and their connection to society as a whole. The constitutional court legitimized is bolstered or weakened, not only based on the source of the appointment of its justice, but also la, the legitimacy of the candidate to be appointed to the constitutional court, charges to review of normative acts carried in public power and its protection of fundamental rights. No? The, judicial lack, uh, the, the judicial ordinary system lacks of legitimacy, on the other hand, is one of the most long-lasting effects of the crisis facing in the justice system in Peru, partially reflecting the country crisis of the state under the rule of law with the corruption. 
In this, uh, it is thus necessary to implement a system for the selection, appointment, and promotion of judges who are able to act as administrator of justice with a proven democratic vocation. This means that they must do their job with independence from political and private power when making judicial decisions. I think it's the main idea that I want to share with you to discuss later that we heard our colleague. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor, for finishing well in time. So it leaves us with more time for the next speaker and, of course, for Q&A. So you want to speak from there? Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I thank the organizers for inviting me to participate in this in this roundtable, particularly to Surya Deva. Thanks for all your efforts and your kindness. Uh, I also want to say that I'm very honored to share this uh, panel with the uh, former president of the Constitutional Court of uh, Peru, my friend Cesar Landa. And I also take the opportunity to salute uh, Professor Mahendra Singh uh, we have uh, worked together in several projects in the last uh, years. Uh, my recognition to your uh, work as uh, educator of several generations of constitutional lawyers here in India, in Singapore, and in Hong Kong, and beyond. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the purpose of my paper is to examine the different mechanisms to appoint a Supreme court justices that have existed in Mexico, trying to identify issues and dilemmas that can be useful for comparative analysis. That's the purpose of the written uh, version of the paper. However, in this presentation, I will concentrate on the uh, examination of the mechanism to appoint justices that exists under the current constitution of Mexico, the Constitution of 1917, focusing on the current debates taking place around this mechanism. Uh, I will not get into the examination of, of the historical and contextual matters explained in the introduction of the paper. There is no time for doing that. But I will at least say two things. The first one, uh, as an institution, Mexico's Supreme Court has struggled to become a true power with real capacity to limit the powers of the other branches of government in the context of the uh, different authoritarian regimes that have existed in Mexico. The other point I want to say is that, uh, as an introduction, is that the uh, uh, constitutional reforms of 1994 that affected that or that had an impact on the Supreme Court of Mexico contributed indeed to produce increased independence of this court. These reforms uh, included uh, changes in the appointment procedure, but not only that, they also included changes uh, in the powers of the court. The, these reforms increased the powers of the court. Uh, the reforms also uh, affected the organization of the federal judicial power, mostly concerning the administration of the federal judicial power. And all of, all of this in the context of the transition towards democracy. Uh, what I, well, my point here, the point I want to make here is that increased independence, independence of the Supreme Court has not been the result or has not only been the result of the appointment procedure, uh, the new appointment procedure, but uh, it has been the result of a whole package of reforms in the context formed by a series of internal and external pressures towards the achievement of that precise goal. Having said that, I turn now to uh, explain the current mechanism to appoint justices of the Supreme Court in Mexico. 
According to Article 96 of Mexico's Constitution, whenever there is a vacancy in the Supreme Court, and here is the procedure, the President of the Republic, of the Republic has the power to nominate a three-name list for each vacancy. The Senate has the power to appoint one of the three candidates in the list by the vote of two-thirds of the Senate's members present. A key point to mention here is that uh, today, nowadays, the Senate is a plural chamber that is not controlled anymore by the President of the Republic as in the past. In the past, we had a, what we called a hegemonic party system, and the President controlled both the vast majority of seats in both chambers of Congress. That doesn't happen uh, anymore. So there is room for negotiation and compromise. Third, third rule, before making uh, its decision, uh, the nominees must appear before the Senate in a hearing. Then, if the Senate does not decide in favor of one of the candidates within 30 days after the reception of the presidential proposal, the president himself is able to pick up the name of the person to fill in the vacancy. If the Senate rejects in its entirety, those are the words used by the Constitution, if the Senate rejects in its entirety, in its entirety the three-name list proposed by the president, the latter has the power to propose to the former a new three-name list. Finally, if the Senate rejects in its entirety the three-name list proposed by the president on two consecutive occasions, the president himself is able to pick up the name of the person to fill the vacancy. The procedure has been criticized on different grounds. First criticism, the president has incentives to propose a three-name list with a strong nominee and with two weak nominees trying to induce the appointment with an unbalanced list, thus affecting the process and the treatment, treatment given to the candidates. And this has happened in actual practice. Second criticism, the president also has the incentive of forming a list that could be rejected in its entirety, entirety by the Senate, since if this rejection occurs twice, the executive has the power to decide instead of the Senate. This has not happened in actual practice, but the incentive is there within the logic of the procedure. Third criticism, there is a problem, a problem derived from the lack of definition in the constitutional text of what happens when after a three-name list has been rejected in its entirety by the Senate, the president includes in a second list one or two of the persons who were rejected in the first list. This happened in in actual practice, but is not congruent with the spirit of the norm. Moreover, fourth criticism, the selection by the president is a process that lacks transparency. There is no consultation, no opportunity for bars, legal scholars, legal practitioners, and judges to give an opinion on the suitability of the nominees. The only limit that the president that the president has in the formulation of his proposal is Article 95 of the Constitution, which establishes the formal requirements to become a justice of the Supreme Court. Fifth criticism, there is a deadline for the Senate to make a decision concerning a, president, a pre presidential proposal, 30 days, but there is no deadline for the president to make his proposal once there is a vacancy in the Supreme Court. In practice, presidents have delayed their proposal for months, thus affecting the integration of the court and its regular operation. Finally, the three-name list increases, uh, the, the, the three-name list system increases the level of politicization of the appointment process. The three nominees compete for political support in the end, it is probable that the person who is actually appointed is not the one with more merits to be a justice, but the one who was able to build up a strong network of political support. And since political supporters usually 
uh, ask for some payment in return for their efforts, this may affect the Supreme Court uh, independence and neutrality. Some scholars have proposed a modification of the above mentioned uh, procedure. In particular, Jorge Carpizo has argued that the system of three name lists should disappear and that the intervention of the President of the Republic in the procedure should be limited. According to this author, the system of lists can inhibit potential good candidates to participate in the process as they are aware that in spite of having the best legal credential, the decision of the Senate will be defined by partisan negotiation. In addition, uh, the constitutional lack of definition <clears throat> of what is to be understood as a new three-name list after the Senate has reject rejected in its entirety a proposal by the President has allowed, as, as I said before, some presidents to propose a new list which includes persons that form part of the list that was previ previously rejected. This ignores the fact that the rejection of the list is individualized with respect to its, its members under the implicit message that none of them was considered suitable to fill in the vacancy. Therefore, a new list would have to e include different people and exclude those who were proposed in the rejected list. On the other hand, in order to limit the intervention of the President of the Republic, who under the current scheme has absolute discretion to integrate the corresponding lists, Jorge Carpizo proposes the following procedure. First, the President of the Republic would have the power to nominate only one person to the Senate as his or her candidate to become a Justice of the Supreme Court. But this nomination should be limited in the sense that the President would have to choose his or her nominee from a list of candidates proposed by several entities, such as the Council of the Federal Judiciary. This is the body in charge of the administration of the federal judicial power. So the Council of the Federal Judiciary, the National Commission of Superior Courts of Justice of the United Mexican States. This is the entity that groups all the presidents of the higher courts of Mexico's uh, states. And third, the third entity, the National Association of Faculties, Laws, Law Schools, Law Departments, and Institutes of Legal Research. Each of these entities would have the power to propose two candidates to the President of the Republic, one of whom could not be a member of the proposing entity. The Senate would have the power to appoint the corresponding justice by the vote of two-thirds of the senators present, uh, as is the rule uh, right now. In a similar vein, other scholars have proposed a mechanism that allows the formation of a list proposed by different groups of civil society, for example, academic institutions, bars, and bars, giving arguments about, about their capacities, abilities, integrity, and suitability to become a Supreme Court justice. The proposal would be directed to the President of the Republic, who would not be formally obliged to select the nominee from that list, but who would have to pay the political cost if he does not. This would imply the need to justify the selection of nominees. In, bo in both cases, the idea is to limit the universe of persons that can be nominated by the President of the Republic, giving a voice to civil society within the appointment procedure of justices of the Supreme Court at the stage of nomination. Final reflections. A, a review and possible reform to the appointment procedure of justices of the Supreme Court should focus on a number of issues such as the ones I will, I will mention immediately. First, which actors intervene in the procedure? Public actors and agencies, political parties, civil society? This issue is related to the legitimacy of the appointees, how they connect with directly elected public officials, and the extent to which civil society can participate and introduce some measure of social legitimacy in the process. It is also related to the definition of which sensitivities are reflected in the Supreme Court. And here I am borrowing 
Wexler's idea that the design of the US Constitution makes it possible to reflect in Congress a local sensitivity, which works as a political safeguard of federalism. On the basis of this idea, theoretically speaking, it is possible to think of different kinds of sensitivities that can be reflect or that could be reflected in the Supreme Court through the constitutional design of the appointment procedure of justices. A gender sensitivity, an ethnic sensitivity, a religious sensitivity, and so on and so forth. The definition of the stages, uh, next point, the definition of the stages of the procedure, nomination and appointment, and the role that the different actors play in each of those stages, a leading and a dominant role, or a minor and subordinate subordinate role and how this is reflected in the rules of procedure. Then is the voting system, a, the kind of majority required to make the designation, absolute majority, a qualified majority, the degree of qualification, for example, absolute majority or two thirds or uh, three quarters of the legislators present when the decision corresponds to a legislative body as an indication of the degree of political consensus required to make the appointment. This issue and the previous one is related to the possibility of promoting the appointment of candidates with a similar profile and, those, and, and thus contribute to generate stable majorities within the Supreme Court. Another point, the deadlines, the definition of deadlines for the completion, completion of the different stages of the appointment procedure. Fifth point, the degree of openness or closure of the procedure. This leads to the definition of how the corresponding hearings are organized, how open or how close they are. It also includes the issue related to the kind of interactions between the nominees and the body that decides the appointment. For example, in the Mexican case, whether the hearings take place before the full house of the senators or before some of the Senate's committees. And it includes also the issue concerning the possibility of civil society to provide some input within the appointment procedure. Finally, the issue of the source of law that regulates the appointment procedure. In the Mexican case, for example, the Constitution says little about the details of the procedure. Statutes pass passed by Congress say nothing and parliamentary agreements of senators are predominant. And this introduces uncertainty within the procedures since every time there is a need to fill in a vacancy within the Supreme Court, new parliamentary agreements change the rules of procedure. Thank you very much. So thanks for uh, two nice presentations. And we heard from two jurisdictions about which at least people who are in the English-speaking side of the world, they get to know quite less. Rather, as a comparative scholar, we always struggle to find more and more material in these areas. So it is quite educative. It's also educative in the sense that uh, this also tries to deal with how to deal with judicial appointments in a, in a situation of political stress and society which is trying to deal with corruption and sometimes where politicians try to use the tool of rhetoric to challenge the legitimacy of the institutions. So a lot can be learned from experiences of these two jurisdictions. Thank you, professors, for such a nice presentation. Mm -hmm.